from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Stu Miniman. Hi, and welcome to a special segment of the Cube here in our East Coast Boston area studio. Happy to be able to dig into the technology space, what's happening in cloud, what's happening in the Boston tech scene with a first time guest to the program, Julie Austin, who is the CTO of DigitalOcean and also uh, part of the, uh, uh, she, she teaches at Harvard Business School. Julia, thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me, great to be here. All right, so so first first time on the program, uh, you're part of the V Mafia. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we talk, you know, uh, you know, Steve Harrod, uh, you know, Jerry Chan, we always love to see where some of the people, especially on some of the early days, you worked closely with Diane Green, you know, where you've gone, what's happened in your career. So for our audience, give them a little bit about your background, uh, what you've been doing, and, sure. and where you are today. Happy to do that. Yeah. So uh, first half of my career was on the IT side of the house, so I was always uh, working on the back end side of things, inside of companies, being in more of an operating role. Um, changing my career midway was to actually work with software. Um, always been a Boston, Massachusetts girl, so uh, was looking for opportunities to be in a startup community, um, work with software companies, and landed at Akamai, um, mid-90s, hate to date myself, but um, got to join Akamai pre-IPO and uh, really got a taste for what it means to build software and uh, scaled that company up down during the bubble burst and, um, and really found my way as uh, an engineering and technology leader on the software side of the house. Um, and taking from some of the 24 system, seven systems that I had managed in my earlier career towards uh, internet infrastructure platform work. Uh, I left Akamai um, and went on to VMware. Uh, it was really fun to get a call from VMware on a very wintry night where uh, very uh, recently after the, the acquisition from EMC where they were just in Palo Alto uh, trying very hard to hire out there as things were starting to scale, the market was getting better. Um, this was 2000, late 2004. Um, and they called me and said, hey, we want to open an office on the East Coast. We have a great relationship now that we're uh, part of the EMC family. Uh, would you come and do that for us? So I joined uh, VMware in um, very, very early 2005 with the initial charter of just expanding engineering from Palo Alto to Boston. A uh, great place to open an engineering office. We were in the middle of Kendall Square, so uh, tapped into the research and academic community. Uh, but also we're a new flagship company, Silicon Valley company, coming to Boston was exactly what we needed at the time. Uh, I like to say we were the first uh, SV company in uh, Boston uh, during that, that era before Google, Microsoft, anybody else had come into Boston yet. Um, so I, I had an eight year wonderful career there. I got to work with Steve Harrod the entire time I was there. Um, he was, I think that's one of my claims to fame. Is he was uh, uh, my boss for the entire eight years where we scaled from uh, 800 employees when I joined to 15,000. Um, and I somehow managed to stick with him throughout as we continued to evolve the organization. Uh, and while I was there, I did a number of things. I, um, I s expanded from not just Cambridge to running all of global R&D as we expanded into different geographies around the world. Um, I started our innovation programs and academic collaboration programs uh, with the academic community, not just here again in Boston, but worldwide. Um, did a startup inside the company, mobile hypervisor project we did that turned into a business unit for the business. Um, this was a great run, it was a really great run. Yeah. So I was there for eight years, uh, and then with a lot of growth and a lot of change, decided it was time to do something different. Um, so I left in 2013 and got plugged into the startup community here in Boston. I was blown away, um, had no idea. I was very VMware, so I didn't realize all, this great thing, all these great things were happening here. There was you know, incubators and accelerators and all these great startups at the CIC. I mean, so many good things going on here in Boston. Yeah. Um, so I got plugged in at Techstars here in Boston. Um, thanks to Katie Ray, Ray a, a shout out to her for bringing me in as a mentor in residence. Uh, got to know a number of startups, learned how to mentor and um, invest in, in very early stage. That was new for me. Uh, drew on my experience from both VMware and Akamai and um, more on the hard technology and, and cloud and infrastructure side of things, but also dabbled in consumer, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm wondering if you can you know, tell our audience a little bit about what you've seen in the Boston tech sure. scene. Most people, I mean, obviously, Harvard, MIT, you know, great colleges, tons of universities right. here really known for biotech, uh, GE moving up here, uh, gets a lot of people talking about how IOT is going to fit in, but what's kind of the breadth and depth that you see of, of the startup ecosystem uh, here in Boston? Here in Boston, yeah, sure. So, so it, what's been interesting here is we've had certainly a preponderance of the biotech, as you say, and hard tech. I think that's really our roots and how it always has been from the old days of you know DEC and, and DG to 
um, to where we are now, and I think that will always be here given the, uh, the strength of the computer science programs here in Boston. We just breed talent like that, which is great. Uh, platform and infrastructure as well. Um, a lot of talent here and a lot of smart people who are thinking about new uh, novel ways to do technology in that space. Um, but we also have a really growing uh, concern around consumer. Um, which I was really impressed to see as I started to plug in after leaving VMware. Uh, another, a number of companies uh, thinking about everywhere from um, pain points for the consumer in e-commerce or pain points in travel. There's a lot of interesting things going around in the travel business um, and in healthcare as well, uh, whether it's on the consumer or on the B2B side of things. So I've been pretty impressed with what's happening here. And there's a really big commitment both by the venture um, folks here as well as the uh, locals to stay here. Um, it's been a struggle. Certainly, there's a big pull to the West Coast. Uh, I think the investor community here is a little bit more conservative in some ways in what they invest in. But when you look at companies like Jibo, who I've you know, worked with for a long time, and, and others doing interesting things with robotics, it, there's just a fascinating swath of things happening here in Boston. Yeah, and, and you've been an angel investor yourself. Uh, you'd, you'd say a little conservative, but you know, robust from, a, uh, yeah. from an investor community. I mean, there's, there's plenty of pitches. There yeah. isn't a day that goes by that I don't get an email from somebody here in Boston who wants to put something in front of me personally. Um, the VC community is very vibrant, um, and they're not lacking for things to take a look at here. Okay, uh, so let, let's talk about what led you to DigitalOcean. Sure. So you, you spend a few years after after VMware. What led you to go to? I, I guess DigitalOcean's been about five years out there, so right. still startup-ish, but yep. you know, not a not a brand new small you know company. Somebody that many of us have heard about for right, years now. Right, so. for sure. So what's funny is um, I got to know DigitalOcean through the TechStars community. Uh, they are TechStars uh, class from Boulder. They were there in 2011, I think, and. Um, it, they had been looking very, uh, they're based in New York, and they were looking for leadership on the technology side for quite some time. Uh, we've had incredible growth over the five years. Um, in, I can't share revenue numbers, but you know, amazing growth, uh, really, really successful fundraising. Um, and i would grown the company almost to 300 people, and we're still relatively flat. Um, I got a reach out from them saying, hey, do you know anybody in Boston or New York who could help us run our technology organization? I personally wasn't looking to do that again. <laughs> I'd already done it twice. I was like, no thank you. I'm happy to see what I can do with you know, my network. But, yeah. um, but then I went and met the team. Um, I was, you know, I'm in New York a lot, so I said I meet the team. And what really struck me, it was sort of three things that really struck me about the business. Um, first, what they had built in five years was just incredible. We have uh, close to a million registered users on our platform. The revenue numbers were outstanding. Um, the culture in the team itself just blew me away in terms of how they had formed as a business in such a short period of time. Um, the, the technology itself was um, superior in terms of how we think about simplicity and what developers really need from a cloud solution, right? So it was no longer a, these are all the, the 5, 10, 20 features you need, but really how does a developer do their job and what do they need so they can just go write software and not worry about setup and configuration and everything else that they need really struck me, their, the simplicity model and how they had thought about that. Um, just blew me away. And then the founders themselves, their passion and their, their intellect was just, um, I've seen this before, right? I've been at two pretty amazing companies. And when you meet founders where you think, these are not average people, these are people who really have taken things to another level and get it, and you want to be part of that. So that, that's how I ended up from not really wanting to have a conversation to next thing you knew I was CTO of the company. All right. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of things there that I want to unpack a yeah, little bit absolutely. for audience. So developers and simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, when you hear cloud, I mean, that was like, oh yeah, cloud, it's, you know, oh, swipe a credit card, it's easy to get started. Developers love doing right. it. We look at the cloud marketplace today and it was like, wow, the cloud's getting kind of complicated. Mm. All the things that we live through in the enterprise, you know, like yourself, I've right. got lots of history on the infrastructure side and it was like, oh, we start out simple and then we keep adding things, adding features, adding knobs and buttons and it becomes a lot more complicated. When I, you know, went to Amazon reInvent, even when I went to Google Show, it's developers are a major audience there, but boy, it, it doesn't really seem like simplicity is uh, kind of job one. So how do you, you know, what do the developers need? How do you, balance that simplicity with actually giving them, you know, flexibility that they need. Right. So at the end of the day, uh, they need a highly performant and feature-rich cloud to do what they need to do, whether that's a simple stand up a small, you know, hosting of a website or it's a more sophisticated set of workloads. Uh, setup and configuration should be easy. It should be, you know, as, as close to a one click as you can get as far as, you know, this is my environment, this is the workload I'm going to go run. Uh, you, you figure it out. 
and let me know what I need uh, versus me spending a lot of time not only doing setup and configuration, but then on the monitoring side and even on the billing side. I mean, one of the things that's fascinated me as I've gotten back into this now um, is how complicated the bill is. I have, um, I'll give you this example, my, my head of engineering that I just brought in from a very large software company, um, he had two full-time engineers on his team to unpack the monthly bill for their cloud provider. Yep. And uh, that was just, hearing that to me said, you know, there's, there's got to be a simpler way. If, I, if developers are spending their time, or VPs of engineering are spending their time worrying about the bill, and, and bills they can't even decipher, they don't even know what they're paying for, right? So it's not just who's spending what where, but also, I don't even know what I'm buying, that's a problem. So we really attacked it from the other side, which is uh, the developers should have the fastest, shortest path to getting their environment set up so they can write their software so their companies can make money, because that's at the end of the day what they want to be able to do and right. serve their own customers, right? And it shouldn't be um, the headaches that they go through or the decision trees that they go through to decide how to even get to that point. And that's what we try to abstract away from them. Okay. Uh, when you see the developers inside the companies, how is kind of the the churn, the stickiness of what they're working on. Do, do they build something and then it you know, moves on premises and they mm -hmm. take care of it? Are they looking at other clouds? W what, what is kind of your typical customer profile look like? It's shifting. I think yeah. it's really changing. So it's gone from, I pick a cloud, the obvious you know, one, two, or three that are out there in the market, and then you know, I'm with that for life. And what I'm seeing now more and more of, as I'm talking to not just my customers, but others that, you know, prospects and others that are in the space, is multi-cloud. So it's no longer there's one cloud that does everything for me. Some of that is just pure contingency planning. It doesn't make sense to have all your eggs in one basket. But some of it is my workloads require different types of support, different types of performance. It's not just about price. Um, and I think that's, again, what the developer today is thinking. I want something I can get onto. The on-ramp's very easy and, and easy to manage, but also serves the needs for the particular workloads that I'm focused on right now. Um, ideally full life cycle, so not just the, the cloud for prototyping or, or, or testing, um, but also for you know, full life cycle to delivery to the customer. Um, again, performance, secure, all the other things that they're looking for, but they're not necessarily saying today, there's one solution for me and that's it. It's no longer the, and, and you see that with, with even all the other apps. I mean, I, when I came to DigitalOcean, the number of apps I had to learn and know because uh, we use them all over the business for different parts of the business, that's just what we do now, right? Everything's distributed, you find the right, uh, application as we say at HBS, you know, the job to get done, right? So yep, there's a yep, job to get done, what tools do I need to do it? And I will pay anything for that tool if it will get that job done for me. Yeah, right. absolutely. Uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of your customers? So uh, I, I know you've expanded, it's not just the individual developer teams and developers as well as whole companies that right. use DigitalOcean. Right. But what, what's that progression? Where, where are your customers Sure, so today? the evolution has been fascinating. Um, the, uh, we started off with more of the hobbyist individual developer. Uh, DigitalOcean's roots really were, you know, if you're going to big, build some big uh, business application, we weren't the choice for you. We have seen an amazing shift uh, with our customer base now, and I'm, I'm, I'm packing that every day in terms of who's using our products and why. Um, it's a it's couple flavors. So one flavor is the, the startup community who is tapping into DO because we, again, we're easy to spin up and, and use. We, we call us ourselves DO. Um, so uh, rapid spin up and now these companies are getting traction and growing and scaling with us and they want to stay with us. They love us. Uh, that was another thing that struck me when I decided to join the company is how many of our customers, people I know who use our product to say, we just love you guys. Like yeah. you just, and it's not just the product itself. It's our community, it's our content, uh, you know, our, our tutorials, everything that we offer to them. It's, yeah. it's a rich experience. Yeah, that goes back to your days in VMware, I'm sure. Completely, yeah. it felt so familiar to me yeah. to come. Do, do you have I Love Do bumper stickers yet, or? Uh? Um, no, but we have heart stickers and sharks. I'll make sure I send you okay. some, because they're really <laughs> um, they're really part of our brand, they're really fun. But Do Love, and Love is actually, we, we joke, we use the uh, heart emoji more than probably any company any of us have ever worked at before. It's, a, it's part of our culture. Um, so the companies are shifting, again, from early stage startups, uh, or uh, what we're also seeing, early stage startup, sorry, to, um, to growing businesses. Um, what we're also seeing are uh, developers, more and more develops or developers are bringing us to work. Uh, so they work in, whether it's a big Fortune 500 company or it's a uh, middle market company where they're saying, you know, actually DigitalOcean can do a lot of the things that we're trying to do on other platforms, easier, faster, better performance, et cetera. Um, whether we start just sort of as a prototyping option for them or test option for them, and then they feel like, you know, actually we can keep these workloads going for production. Um, we're seeing 
a lot more of that. And that's been an interesting progression for the company from the individual developer to the professional developer. And then we have this new class of mid-market customers who are, again, um, pushing the envelope with us in, in fun and interesting ways and trying to use us um, beyond just uh, a couple, we call them droplets, you know, our VMs are droplets. So beyond a couple of, or a small cluster of droplets to full production systems running on our platform. Yeah, uh, when we kind of step back and look at the cloud industry, a lot of times people mischaracterize. They don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, when we when we first did our our first kind of what is the revenue in cloud, it's like, well, the big thing in cloud today is really SaaS. Mm -hmm. You know, two thirds of revenue today is software as a service. I, I'm curious, have you done kind of the uh, the jobs to be done look mm -hmm. at things like infrastructure as a service and mm -hmm. say, you know, how is the cloud market today? How is it delivering on those promises? And mm -hmm. how do you guys differentiate between kind of th those big players that we mentioned? before. So I want to be sure I understand the question in terms of um, is it just SaaS applications? Is it is it beyond SaaS? And I, I, I guess the, the premise was, you know, when I go read, you know, I, we, we've got some of the financial channels on the TV right. outside. When they say cloud, I don't think they understand what they're talking about. Gotcha. And even when you read lots of articles, we boil it down, we oversimplify it to be like, oh, okay, there's a shift because of something they understand, and Amazon's a huge company, or right. Microsoft owns all of your apps, and you know there, there's a little bit of truth there, but it misses a lot of the nuance that's going on. Right. And when you say, what is the business justification? What's the jobs to be done that I get by using right. infrastructure as a service or cloud in general, compared to what I was doing sure. before? Because it's not, j we, we know today it's not just, oh, hey, building data centers is really tough, and I'm not good at it, so I can do something cheaper by turning to some other service. I mean, part of that's true, but right. it's way more you know, nuanced. Yeah, I agree, so, so. there's a lot of, uh, several <laughs> business cases, right? Yeah. So there's there's exactly what you just said, which is I don't want to get, I don't want to be in the hardware business or own a data center or manage a data center because that's expensive and, and not just the hardware itself, but the, the people to manage it. Yeah. Um, so that in itself can be very compelling. Uh, some of it is the flexibility and agility you have with elasticity in the, in the cloud, right? So uh, when I need to have, uh, whether it's seasonality or I have certain workloads that hit peak, um, being able to scale up and down is very difficult when you're working on-prem or you have your own hardware, right? Mm -hmm. That, that uh, becomes challenging. So I think the cloud affords that uh, set of capabilities as well as geographic reach in terms of how far you can go and what you want to do depending on where your customers are. Right. Um, so I think it gives you a lot of that flexibility uh, as well as balance and contingency around security and other things that a lot of companies are trying to solve for right now. Uh, and it's a challenge. I think there's still, certainly not from the early VMware days where um, we were trying to convince uh, customers to go from test and dev to putting real production applications in VMs, sure. right? You know, it's kind of, we're way past that now. We don't have to convince anybody of that anymore. Yeah, and, and, and there were some simple models. I mean, I remember there was, I think it was IBM did a commercial and it's like, where'd all the servers go? Right. Oh, I took my 100 servers and put it down to, you know, 10 servers. And right. oh wow, that was a simple, straight, you know, utilization, I kind of understood that. Cloud's a little bit cloudier. Yeah, it's, you know? it's, it's funny, right? But I think it's proven it's proven it's a, a real thing, right? We're yeah. no longer questioning Absolutely. what's this ether or I'm nervous. Yeah, yeah. You know, I talked to a venture uh, guy locally um, a couple years ago who said there's going to be a day where everyone's going to give up on the cloud and put it back into hardware again and not there. <laughs> I, I think yeah. maybe there's some well, things. I, I think we understand that there's still hardware in the clouds and we're getting right. to hear about that right. a, a right. little bit more, but yeah, it, this, this cloud, you know, wave is definitely for real. It was definitely <laughs> for real, and you know, and, and as uh, as our CEO likes to always say, you know, at the end of the day, you still, you know, when we talk about serverless and microservices, you still need a server, right? So, so the servers are still there. But I think also what's interesting, and we used to wonder about this back at VMware as well, is what does happen to that hardware? Do we do? Is it no longer interesting anymore for the business? Mm -hmm. But not now. The hardware itself is getting more sophisticated in its capabilities. Moore's law certainly it's evolving the way you would expect it to evolve. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's enabling us to do more interesting things uh, in the cloud that we weren't able to do before, and just m memory and, and, and CPU and how we're able to optimize there is it's terrific. All right, so so you've got an operations background. He here's here's the thing I, I've been kind of looking at is I remember VMware had a great utilization story, but storage and networking, mm -hmm. you know, caused a lot of ripples that took over a decade to fix. And from an overall operational model, mm -hmm. I didn't feel it had a huge push on how much I'm spending in my data center from mm -hmm. an operation standpoint. Mm -hmm. Cloud, we understand some of the changes, but operationally, you already mentioned, you know, I need to have a couple of people working on pricing, which right, right. before it would just, oh, procurement, take care of the boxes, and then I run around and, and take it. Right. How, how, is, how is the operational model of cloud today, and what do we need to fix as an industry to make it even better? Yeah, I, I, 
I think it's shifting in that it was still that question, and, and it is today, it's very much so most of the big providers, you're still asking the question, what am I paying for connectivity or what am I paying for bandwidth, what am I paying, I mean, it's still there, right? So that hasn't gone away, we've just put it in the ether, it's, it's not physical anymore. Um, but m my assertion is that becomes less and less of what anybody wants to think about, nor should they, right? So uh, I draw a lot of parallels to the telcos, right? And there's, there was a point where um, we would see the commercials that say, you know, do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? And it was all about where your cell towers were, right? right? Nobody cares about that anymore, right? We care about the data plans. We care about uh, whether, uh, if I'm on the family plan, you know, who's, who's chewing up more downloads on Snapchat uh, than someone else on my family plan. Uh, but at the end of the day, my, my phone service is my phone service. And I think that's what we're going to get to with the cloud, which leaves us open to then what's interesting after that. And for me, what's interesting after that are the tools developers need on top of the cloud, right? Which is a lot of where I'm spending my time thinking and our roadmap at DigitalOcean is we cater to the developer. The developer knows we trust them. We're developers, we get them. Um, okay, so the cloud has to be the best it can possibly be for you. But let's not get caught up in all the details and minutia. Let's give you the additional tools you need to go from you know, coding to deploying to operating the software that you're writing. Uh, what is important to you to do that? What's getting interesting in terms of whether it's uh, edge computing, IoT, uh, interesting applications that are tapping into AI and machine learning? Uh, what do we do to ensure that you can build upon that cloud to do great things? Yeah. Um, and I think that's where we're going. I think it's less, again, about uh, the hardware itself or optimizing everything underneath in the platform. That's our job. We have to do that excellent, uh, and we do, I think. Um, it's again, now let's take you to the next level on what you need to do to build your software. Yeah, uh, any comment on that edge computing that you brought up? Mm. You know, with something we've been looking at from a research standpoint yeah. at Wikibon for the last couple of years. And Peter Levine wrote, you know, kind of cloud mm -hmm. computing is dead. You know, yeah. you work for a cloud computing company. We so. do, and he's on our board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so maybe you know, g give your take as to what that means, the shifts that you're seeing in data centers, cloud, edge, and you know how that. How that yeah, puts I, I out think and how Dio fits. In some ways, it's a lot of what we saw at Akamai, which was at some point everyone's going to get this internet thing, and then the next <laughs> question is, what are they going to do with it, right. right? And how far out are we going to go? Uh, IoT is no longer a something people are maybe thinking about. It's real, right? And as we start to think of the devices that are now out there and the capabilities that are closer to the edge for performance and um, and other capabilities, and even data for that matter, how close do you get the data and the performance to your, your end user? Um, I th again, I think we have to build pathways to that, and we have to understand that is the trend. That's where applications are going to tap into those devices and the connectivity back, whether it's to the cloud or it's some hybrid environment, we have to be able to support that. So I think that's where, where the world is going. We're definitely, I've seen a lot of interesting research even here in Boston uh, in that space. And um, to not be thinking about it and how you're going to support it underneath, uh, I think you'd be missing something. Okay, uh, last question I have for you, Julia, is you're a CTO and you, you teach at HBS. Yep. What's exciting you these days? Let's maybe even forget the cloud space if yeah, you want. Sure. But you know, what's interesting, you, what, what, what's catching your interest these days? Uh, so, I, where I'm fascinated is, uh, my personal interest has always been around AR and VR and what's happening uh, it, as the, what will be the killer app and what are we going to be simulating or what are we going to be experiencing and I would say even in how developers work, um, as we have more and more distributed teams in engineering, we have more and more uh, distributed development efforts. Uh, what does that really mean experientially? And I'm, I'm waiting to see the thing that's going to be, the, ah, that's what we use VR for, right? Um, but in my world, in, in technology, I think understanding and embracing that um, we are going to be in a world where whether it's you know holograms or whatever it is, we're going to be interacting with people in a different way. Uh, how leaders think about managing those teams or managing this new suite of technology, what, and even IoT, I think at that point is passe. It's, it's AR, VR is happening. Um, it's not even uh, the infrastructure and how it supports that, but how people and humans interact with each other in this new type of hybrid world where I've got humans right in front of me and I have humans on Google Hangouts and I have um, this new sort of uh, headset thing that I think over time won't be a headset anymore. Um, it's going to change the conversation and how humans behave with each other. I, there's really interesting research happening here in Boston in that space. And I think that's the stuff that will start going from, again, it's a toy, it's not real to uh, these are things that are actually impacting our jobs, our day to day, our homes, everything. It's fascinating stuff. All right. Well, Julia, I wish we could stay for a couple more hours to Me talk too. through some <laughs> of this, but we will catch up with you next time. Julia Austin, CTO of DigitalOcean, thanks so much for joining us, and thank you for watching theCUBE. Great to be here.